Our topic for this session will be hepatic infections. Our first is a case of cytomegalovirus infection in a child. This is a great example of periportal edema. You see the circumferential hypodensity surrounding the portal venous branches. There is marked splenomegaly, and as is frequently the case in marked splenomegaly, the spleen becomes friable and outgrows its own blood supply, resulting in multifocal infarcts, one of which you see here. Lower down, you can appreciate the marked gallbladder wall edema. Of course, the list of differential possibilities associated with that finding is vast, but cytomegalovirus or other viral uh, hepatitis infections are certainly on that list. And lower down another one of those geographic hypodensities denoting a splenic infarct. So on the cine, you can appreciate the extent of that gallbladder wall edema. And we get another look at the marked splenomegaly and the multifocal geographic hypodensities, both superiorly and inferiorly, denoting splenic infarcts. So that is a case of cytomegalovirus infection, periportal edema, gallbladder wall edema, splenomegaly, and associated infarcts. Our next case is a case of hepatitis with nodular regeneration. You can certainly appreciate the hepatomegaly as well as the extensive and pronounced fatty infiltration. There are also numerous isodense and hyperdense nodules throughout the liver consistent with nodular regeneration. And you can see the marked fatty infiltration and the massive enlargement of the liver, which extends well down into the pelvis. And again, appreciate all of those isodense and even hyperdense nodules throughout. It's the history that makes this uh, fascinating case. This was a woman who was traveling abroad and suffered an acute illness with fever, jaundice, vomiting, and diarrhea. She ultimately had recovered pretty much well enough to return home to the States, at which point she had this scan almost three weeks out from the onset of her illness. So historically, this was uh, pretty clearly a straightforward hepatitis A infection, and that gives you a nice sense of the time course of that illness and the regeneration that followed it. Our next case is a straightforward pyogenic hepatic abscess. It's certainly worth noting that these abscesses tend to be multiloculated, very complex in appearance, yet still are typically just E. coli infection uh, from diverticulitis or colitis, clearly the most common source and clearly the case in this particular instance. See again that multiloculated complex fluid collection within the pelvis, or sorry, within the right liver lobe and the diverticulitis with stranding in the left lower quadrant. That is a pyogenic hepatic abscess due to diverticulitis and the result of an E. coli infection. Here is another pyogenic hepatic abscess case, this one multifocal and resulting pretty clearly from portal venous septic thrombosis, uh, also multifocal. So you can see not only are there well circumscribed hypodensities, fluid densities within the liver, but also there are pronounced perfusion changes throughout the parenchyma, reflecting variable occlusion of portal venous branches. The colonic wall thickening is present here as well. Not as much stranding as on the prior case, but the ultimate causative agent being E. coli certainly points to the colon as the source for all of this. So note again, not only the hypodense uh, fluid collections within the liver, but hypodense filling defects within the portal vein and the marked perfusion changes present throughout the liver. 
So that is a case of pyogenic hepatic abscesses related to septic thrombophlebitis of the portal vein. Our next case is a gonorrheal infection resulting in Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. This is a beautiful example showing you peripheral hepatic enhancement. That's parenchymal subcapsular enhancement of the liver that was only present on the early arterial phase images. In addition, the ultimate source of the problem can be determined to be a cervicitis. Here you see the enhancing mucosa of the endocervical canal, a pretty unusual finding, and there is a uh, significant edema or hypodensity of the adjacent cervix itself, putting that in marked contrast. Here you can appreciate that subcapsular parenchymal enhancement throughout the liver and in the pelvis the cervical enhancement as well. That is a relatively unusual case of Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome with that subcapsular hepatic parenchymal enhancement tipping you to the diagnosis. Our next case is amoebiasis resulting in a large right hepatic abscess. You see here a unilocular collection of gas and fluid highly destructive and pretty characteristic of a hepatic abscess from amoebiasis. Lower down in the abdomen, you can appreciate some pericolonic stranding, denoting the amoebic colitis as the origin of this infection. So here you can appreciate that unilocular destructive collection of fluid and gas and the pericolonic stranding denoting the amoebic colitis. So that's amoebiasis with colitis and a resultant hepatic abscess. Our next case is of Clostridium difficile causing a hepatic abscess. This abscess is interesting in that it is multiloculated. In fact, on the cine you'll appreciate all the little loculations within there that are really relatively well circumscribed and will make you certainly think of hydatid disease as a possibility. But lower in the abdomen, we are given another finding that helps us really put this one all together. There is extensive pancolonic wall thickening of a type that is highly, highly suggestive of Clostridium difficile infection. So here is that multiloculated abscess, again, the kind of thing that might even make you think of hydatid disease uh, were it seen in isolation. But lower down, you can definitely appreciate the pancolitis involving the entire visualized extent of the colon, and again, highly, highly suggestive of Clostridium difficile infection. So that is a pancolitis from C. diff causing a right hepatic abscess. Our last case is a case of hydatid disease. And this one is a particular favorite of mine. I have many cases of hydatid disease, and many of them show the multiloculated fluid collections with daughter cysts uh, that are so pathognomonic. But this is a less common manifestation of hydatid disease that I think is represented here better than just about any case I've ever seen. So you can tell, obviously, there are well-circumscribed uh, hypo- and hyperdense hepatic lesions here in the right liver lobe. But this one, particularly in the posterior right liver lobe, shows a serpiginous linear filling defect uh, that is unique. And that is the detached membrane finding of hydatid disease. Ultimately, that is what uh, that is the same phenomenon that leads to the camelote finding in hydatid cysts on chest x-ray, the water lily finding. That is, in fact, a detached and flattened floating membrane from a hydatid cyst. So there is a case of hydatid cyst with detached membrane 
and that concludes this session on hepatic infections.